Good afternoon, everyone. I now call this public hearing of the America 250 PA Infrastructure Improvements and Projects Committee to order. I'm Kristen Phillips Hill. I have the great pleasure of co chairing this committee with my good friend and colleague, Representative Jared Solomon from Philadelphia, and I'm honored to have this duty, and I, I'm also honored to represent the 28th District in the State Senate of Pennsylvania representing Southern New York County. So the purpose of today's hearing is to identify infrastructure and projects that not only highlight uh, the various regions across our Commonwealth history, but also highlight the contributions that uh, folks have made to our shared history up to and including our semi-quincentennial in 2026. So this committee has been tasked with identifying potential infrastructure investments and projects that showcases Pennsylvania's vital role in the establishment of and the growth of our great nation in its 250 years since our founding in 1776. The committee was established as the legislative advisory group to support the work of the larger America 250 PA organization. Uh, we are a bipartisan, bicameral effort, and our work has been sub subdivided into six regions of Pennsylvania, each of which is represented by two members, one of each party from the Pennsylvania House and the Pennsylvania Senate, as well as members from the overall leadership team and ex officio members. This has been quite an undertaking. Uh, this is our second hearing in this reason, in this region. And uh, before I begin, I think it would be uh, terribly remiss if we did not thank Penn State Harrisburg for hosting our meeting today. Um, we're very grateful for the lovely accommodations and there is water and some sweet treats uh, by the door that you came in and um, a, a bit of housekeeping if you need to use the restroom. It is out the doors, make a right, make another right, and it'll be on your left. Um, and with that, I would like to recognize my good friend uh, and co-chair, Representative Jared Solomon of Philadelphia. Thank you so much, Senator. Why don't we all say, can we say this three times, semi-quincentennial? Is that even possible? I don't know that it's possible. Let's try. One, two, three. Semi-quincentennial. 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 All right. Not much energy, but I know, I know. We'll do it at the end. We'll see if we can get revved up. But, uh, you know, when I think, uh, and thank you so much, Senator, for presenting kind of the, what the scope of this project is, but this is uh, really aspirational. We want to try and find a way to welcome the rest of the world and nation to Pennsylvania in 2026. And we are preparing the groundwork to do that work. Each of our districts uh, have a story to tell. I think of my own district in Northeast Philadelphia, the most diverse district in the whole Commonwealth. We just, um, in the last two years, had a explosion of the Brazilian population, um, one of the fastest growing Brazilian populations in the country, one of the fastest growing Chinese American populations in the country. That story needs to be part of how we talk about 2026, 250, because it is critical to the fabric of my neighborhood in Northeast Philadelphia, as is the history of the neighborhood, which used to be primarily Jewish, Irish, and German. It used to be the center of industry for the rest of the nation. Uh, so all of that goes into presenting kind of a intricate fabric of all of these interwoven stories about what Pennsylvania is presently and what, what it can be, will be, uh, in 2026 and beyond. That's why it's so great to have Representative Kim here, because just like I have my story, and Senator, the Senator has her story in her district, Representative Kim has a story that the folks in her uh, district, in her legislative district, want to tell. 
Um, and if there's a way that we can connect those stories, uh, what a 2026 it will be. And so the presentations that you are providing are going to be key to the narrative in creating that lasting legacy in Pennsylvania in 2026. Am I turning it over to Representative Kim, or are you going to turn it over to Representative Kim? We, we would love to turn it over to Representative Kim. <laughs> we will and both turn I, it over. I would like to say um, I, I'm really glad you didn't go down that revolutionary path again because we have a lot of Yorkers here, and, and it would have re been necessary for I hear to about remind this at every you that single you know, when the hearing. founders couldn't be safe in Philadelphia, know, we, we had to take care of them in York. And with that, I'm going to turn minutes. it over to Representative okay. Kim. <laughs> I'm just filling in today. I don't know what I got myself into. Um, State Rep. Patty Kim, I represent parts of Dauphin and Cumberland Counties. I'm filling in for Representative Madsen. I look forward to hearing your testimonies today and the great ideas that you have prepared for us. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here today, Representative Kim. You'll want to come back again. I can guarantee that. And with that, I'd also like to welcome Cassandra Coleman. She is the Executive Director of America 250 PA. Thank you, Senator, and hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. As the Senator mentioned, America 250 PA is obviously the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's commission that was charged with planning and coordinating all of the programming projects and events around the 250th anniversary of our, the United States in 2026, and we are so excited to be building the foundation across this Commonwealth. Our legislation specifically calls that this initiative needs to reach every Pennsylvanian in all 67 counties. So again, we are thrilled to continue to build those partnerships with all of you. Um, I do encourage you to go to our website at America250PA.org. We have over a dozen programs and projects currently ongoing across the Commonwealth with a whole heck more in the hopper, um, and we're starting to work on the calendar of events for 2026 as well. But we are looking forward to your testimonies today, and I'm just going to quickly go over the hearing process. So um, one of our co-chairs will introduce um, each testifier and the organization. At that time, we ask you to come forward and take the seat at the testifying table. Um, from the time you begin your testimony, you will have five minutes at uh, 30 seconds remaining, you're going to hear one bell ding. And then at the end of the five minutes, you're going to hear two. And then from there, at that point, we ask you to please um, finish whatever thought or sentence that you're, you're, um, you're working on. And then um, the panel, and you will have up to three minutes um, for question and answer if the panel should have any questions. So that is the process today. So I think we are ready to get started. Okay, let's get moving. Uh, Michael Ferreira, COO of Vision Solutions. Hi, Michael. How you doing? Welcome, and please uh, begin. Good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Mike Ferreira, and I'm the COO of Vision Solutions AR. We're a small software startup company that is proudly located in downtown York. My partner, Andy, started the company as an engineering consultancy in 2013, and we started developing augmented reality software in 2018. We currently employ a marketing hire from York College and two software development interns, and hopefully future employees from Penn State. We started our software development efforts participating in a small company incubator sponsored by Ben Franklin Technology Partners and eventually received initial startup funding from Ben Franklin. We currently have active AR projects in our community with both Explore York and the York History Center. Thank you for letting me speak to you today to present an exciting proposal for Pennsylvania's America 250 celebration. As we approach the 250th anniversary of the United States, we have an incredible opportunity to commemorate our rich history and heritage in a truly innovative and immersive way using augmented reality. I recognize that this is a somewhat unique proposal under a program aimed at infrastructure improvements, 
But while we're not proposing a bricks and mortar project per se, augmented reality technology falls under the umbrella of the digital infrastructure of a facility and is similar but much more powerful than adding touchscreen displays or physical video screens uh, to an existing museum. For those of you not familiar with augmented reality technology, I want to be clear, we are not talking about wearing an immersive headset and floating around with Mark Zuckerberg in a virtual world. AR is more like the heads-up display in your car, overlaying supplemental content in your field of view and is meant to be enjoyed while at a museum or historical site to enhance that experience. Augmented reality offers several key advantages in preserving and showcasing our historical heritage. First, it brings accessibility to a new level. With just a smartphone or AR glasses, augmented reality allows the visitors to experience history like never before. They can witness firsthand important events, interact with historical figures, and explore historical artifacts in a fully interactive and immersive manner. It adds emotional depth to the experience, forging a profound connection with our nation's past. AR will create an exciting and informative learning environment for both young people and adults. Using our AR platform to enable historical exploration, we can attract a broader audience and instill a love for history in the younger generation. For the staff operating museums and historical sites, our easy-to-use web-based AR content management platform allows them to very easily change AR content. They can use our platform at their facility or remotely from a desktop computer, both during the America 250 celebration and for many years to come. AR is a highly visual medium, so if you'll indulge me by looking at the back of the handouts that I provided you today, I can walk you through some examples of the types of things we can potentially do as part of this project. Starting in the top left, imagine visiting a battlefield or the Delaware River crossing and seeing from a particular vantage point reenactment video, historical pictures, or other descriptive content overlaid onto your field of view. At the top right, we show the, our capability to scan an actor, in this case portraying Ben Franklin, to act as a virtual 3D avatar guide, providing both narrative information and a unique picture-taking opportunity. The picture in the bottom left shows our use of photogrammetry to capture detailed 3D duplicates of historical artifacts, enabling them to be examined virtually at any desired location. And finally, we can use artificial intelligence to bring historic photos and paintings to life, even allowing the pictures to talk. If, like us, your imagination has no limits, there are many more possibilities for using AR in fun and creative ways to enhance the visitor experience. Under the funding available for this project, we propose creating custom AR digital content for up to 15 Revolutionary War sites, um, in Pennsylvania with suggested sites including in our submitted proposal. We can execute this plan or work with America 250 PA's committee to add alternate or additional sites or content as desired. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today and welcome any questions you might have. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Members, questions? Representative Solomon? So is this, this technology developed or the money is going to go to provide you with sort of the R&D to create the technology? It is completely developed. It exists today. Our uh, back-end content management system is up and running on the web. You can download our app from the app stores today um, on Android or Apple devices. Um, you have to be in a location that we scan for AR. The only thing you would be able to see is our brief demo that we have on there that allows you, we can view anywhere. But it is a commercially available product and ready to go. So the money goes to the, okay, the setup, creation, unique 3D and digital content. Okay, can you just explain like where the, the dollars would go? So the first thing we do is we go out and scan the site using a 3D camera to create a digital twin of the site. That allows us to place AR content in a lot of the you know, linked content as well. And a lot of that money is used for meetings with each individual site or with the committee to discuss what content you want. And it's all about content creation and placing the content where you want. Because the platform is ready to go, most of the money will go towards content creation. Content cre so the, the, the battlefields, for instance, they're ready for this? They want this? They're so expecting this technology? So we've discussed this with a couple of the sites, but quite frankly, we haven't discussed it with all. We were hoping that there would be coordination from a higher level as far as what sites to approach. I mean, I, I don't know if anybody would turn down the opportunity if, 
you know, they were getting it funded to add, you know, this type of capability. Um, we can add it at any site. It's really just we priced it based on, on 15 sites. Thank you so much. Yeah. Further questions? When you gave us that qu quote of cost, how long does that cover? So this goes up, it's hosted somewhere. There are uh, continuous operational costs. Um, do you envision uh, the amount that you've asked for covering those long-term hosting costs? Or will there be um, costs in the future that will need to be the responsibility of another entity? Yeah, that's a great question. And we priced it that hosting the content, we built, first of all, building the content and hosting it through the 2026 events. Um, but then after that, there is a normal, if, if this platform can be up for the next 20 years and constantly adding AR content, changing it by the seasons, and we've typically worked in, especially for early adopters, like it's about a $2,500 a year per site um, maintenance fee after that point. Um, so really, you know, in, in the con customers we've talked to so far have found that pretty reasonable, uh, but it's really for us maintaining all of the information on the Amazon cloud and license fees and things like that. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony today. All right. Thank you. I'd like to let the record reflect that we are joined by Senator Sharif Street. Good to see you. Good to and see you, Senator. Would you care to offer any brief opening remarks? I uh, just want to thank everyone who's particip who is um, participating, um, my colleagues, um, as well as um, everyone who has come to uh, offer testimony. These are, this is an, we're making important investments, and I think it is, uh, we, don't, we don't have opportunities to make those investments unless people take time to develop proposals for us to review. And so we really do thank all of you for your willingness to participate. And I apologize for my tardiness. There was getting out of Philadelphia sometimes can be challenging. <laughs> we understand. We're just glad that you're here. Um, our next testifier today is Jeffrey Nichols, the CEO of the National Civil War Museum. Mr. Nichols, please proceed when you are ready. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, inviting us to speak today. And hello to uh, Representative Kim, who is uh, from my district, one of now three that we have uh, in our little park that we, we are located in. So we're, we have an abundance of state uh, reps um, helping support the museum. Uh, the National Civil War Museum, of course, is a 501c3 nonprofit uh, based in Harrisburg, which interprets the story of the Civil War uh, to visitors from across the country and around the world. Uh, the legacy of the war and its aftermath are more vital today than at almost any time in our history. And it is critical for our audience to have a well-maintained and updated facility which to discover the full story of the war. We are one of the largest museums in the country dedicated to telling the story of the American Civil War, a crucial turning point in and an important chapter of American history. Since we opened to the public in 20, uh, 2001, we have welcomed over 1 million people from all 50 states and 35 countries. Uh, with the events in Charlottesville, Black Lives Matter, the pivotal attack on the U.S. Capitol in 2021, as a country, we've been challenged to reflect upon our nation's history. Our impressive archive of over 38,000 Civil War-related artifacts uh, collected over the past 28 years helps us to tell the full story and better understand the legacy of the American Civil War. In an effort to open museum, uh, the museum access to everyone, we joined the Institute of Museum and Library Services, IMLS, Museums for All Initiative, Participants who benefit from SNAP um, uh, cards receive free admission for up to four by presenting their EBT card uh, when they enter the museum. We have over, we've served over 270 individuals since we started this program earlier this year. We've also been named a Blue Star Museum, offering free admission to active duty military members and their families from Armed Forces Day to Labor Day. And of course, we are part of the Education Innovation Opportunity um, uh, ta uh, improvement tax credit program in Pennsylvania, uh, and we use those monies to subsidize admission uh, to um, 
for Pennsylvania Public Schools to the museum. In 2001, the museum entered into a long-term lease agreement with the city of Harrisburg to operate and manage the day-to-day -day operations uh, of the building and to maintain the city's collection of Civil War artifacts. In 2017, we extended that agreement until 2039 with an option for additional 30 years through 2069. As part of our agreement with the city, we are responsible for building, for building maintenance and capital improvements to the building. Uh, this, the museum itself is 66,000 square foot building uh, purposely built to house a museum with funding from the Commonwealth. Uh, the building has over 25,000 square feet of exhibit, uh, exhibition and educational spaces open to the public and an additional 6,000 square feet of archival and collection rooms to store, preserve, and maintain those uh, city artifacts. The remaining square footage is public space that we use for facility rentals and other activities. When it was built, um, uh, the equipment and exhibits, of course, were state-of-the-art back in 2001. Over the past 22 years, uh, the equipment has begun to reach the end of its life cycle, uh, and the building is showing signs of its age. Since 2018, we have invested over $750,000 in building repairs and upgrades, particularly to the heating air conditioning system within the museum. Uh, recently, we've applied for two National Endowment for the Humanities NEH grants to replace the humidification system and the control systems for the entire HVAC system uh, that will complete the recommended upgrades. However, there are other capital projects that need to be addressed so that the museum can continue to serve the community. And I should also note that NEH grants are highly competitive. There's a 15 to 20 percent success rate, so it's, a, it's always a challenge. Well, specifically, the museum's roof and rotunda ceiling uh, need to be repaired to address a long-term design and construction issue that allows water to leak through the rotunda's windows onto the floor and our visitors below. Uh, the rotunda ceiling has been repaired twice uh, in that 20-year period, but the underlying leak has not been repaired. And the last estimate we had, which was earlier, uh, late last year, was slightly over a million dollars to do that work. Lighting in the galleries also requires an update. Uh, currently, it's a collection, really a hodgepodge of halogens, incandescent light bulbs, fluorescent lighting, some LEDs. Um, this configuration, of course, emits tremendous heat, as well as UV light uh, that is not conducive to artifact preservation. So we would love to replace all of those, uh, running on an estimate right now of $250,000, but that is just an internal estimate. We haven't had a, a firm one yet. Um, and the humidification control systems, they are also in need of upgrade, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and that estimated cost, which is much more concrete, is about $550,000 on top of what we've already spent. So these uh, projects will help bring our building up to uh, a, a truly wonderful standard to help us celebrate 2026. And I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Members, questions for Mr. Nichols? Representative Kim. I'm going to try to remain unbiased, but um, fun fact, my husband and I wanted to get married at the Civil War Museum. We oh, had really? to change dates, and we'd have our family members pick blue or gray. I'm kidding. We wouldn't do that. <laughs> um, but it is a beautiful building, and um, again, I have to be unbiased. So thank you for your testimony. Thank you, and Good. I should also add that um, thanks to your support. We actually just replaced one of the boilers recently um, on the hottest day of the year, but it's yes. in place, so that's good. Congratulations. Director Coleman. And Jeff, how many visitors do you see a year? Uh, right now, post-COVID, around 25, 26,000 all in. Pre-COVID, we're in the mid-30s, so we still haven't seen a complete um, pullback, but we certainly are on the, on the right trend. And this summer has been very good. It's one of the first times since I've been there in two years that's really seemed like it's getting back to a, a normal pattern. But and do you keep track of the location from where folks are yes, coming from? Yes, we do. And do you see, is it a lot of Pennsylvania? Is it a lot of other I, states? Is there's it some Pennsylvania, but this time of year it's mostly out of state. It's around Pennsylvania to, is the core, uh, but we had people from the Netherlands and other places just uh, yesterday. So they come from all over this time of year. And how about of that number, how many are school children? Um, we've had about 35,000 school children since 2018 in, in that time frame. Okay. So, and that's slowed down considerably too, as we all have the experience, I'm sure, but it's slowly coming back. Thank you. You're welcome. Representative Solomon. Thanks, Senator. Um, I don't know what it is about being a state representative, but since I've been a state representative, I've heard, learned more about HVAC systems <laughs> than I, I, it's yeah. unreal. Everyone is looking at HVAC, and I, I, it, all of us, I'm not an expert by any means, mm -hmm. but everyone's talking about HVAC systems. Can you um, 
So you've got a lot of great repairs and its core infrastructure needs. Mm -hmm. You'll have, if, assuming you know, we were able to fund part of these, all of these repairs, so then you have this beautiful new building ready to go. What's then the vision in 2026? What would you want to do? Sure. Well, we're ramping up uh, for that, as most of my colleagues behind me are. And so we want to celebrate the history of the country, obviously, but through the Civil War perspective. Uh, and talk about that particular legacy. I, I heard from Cassandra in the past that it really is telling the full story of American history. Obviously, the Revolutionary War in that era will be critical. But I think we have, an, as I mentioned in my notes, a very important role to play, considering all that we've been through over the past decade. Uh, showing what getting to a true point of crisis is for a country and maybe how to avoid such a thing and move forward. So for us, we want to do more talks and programs. We offer free days for local community to come in and enjoy the museum. So it will be really building upon all of those elements. Uh, we're in the planning phases right now uh, for a potential symposium as well that year. So we're thinking in, in that sense, but hopefully a lot of family activities and other projects that are relevant to, uh, to telling the full story uh, of American history. Thank you so You're much. Welcome. Senator Street. Uh, one, thank you for the work you're doing. Uh, and just looking at some of your remarks, I, I, th I do believe you're right um, that it is the work you're doing in telling the full story of America by talking about the Civil War and everything that led up to it is, uh, is incredibly useful in today's society, uh, reminding us that going too far down that path can be problematic and also reminding us of the fullness of our history. It's impossible to talk about the Civil War without talking about some of America's uh, larger challenges uh, historically, slavery, uh, Jim Crow, all of that. Um, and so I, you know, I think it's important that we not just focus on the Revolutionary War but also the Civil War. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, because there will be many people who walk in your doors and hopefully we encourage um, lots of them. Uh, how much of your content is available in terms of online stuff so the people who don't have the opportunity to walk in your doors can also access it? Younger people particularly are are accessing content online sometimes even if they live across the street because that's just the way they are wired. Right. Um, and so what are you doing in that space? Well, we have principally been focused on that 25,000 square foot exhibit space um, and telling that full story. Uh, over COVID and, and before, we started doing a lot online, of, mostly through videos and other programs that we can record um, to try to reach different audiences. Um, but I think the key thing that we'll be focusing on building out is our outreach for schools. Uh, we realize that, and particularly in Harrisburg, it's very much a challenge even to get kids from a Harrisburg school to the museum for myriad reasons. So if we can go out to that classroom and, and go to them, that's what we're, we're going to keep building on. We do a little bit of it now. We'll be doing more. Uh, we also recently had a grant that was able to purchase a lot of equipment that will help us with that. So that sort of outreach, videos, audio, uh, social media, all of that is, is being used. Um, but I think that what is great about our museum and so many others is being able to come in and see those artifacts, see those elements in the, in the collection and, and view that story. So we never want to abandon that, but we're going to supplement it uh, in the ways that you're talking about. Yeah. Because you're, you're absolutely right. It, you have to hit the audience where they are. Yeah, nor did I mean to suggest that you should abandon your no, of course mission. Not. No, of course not. Um, I think <laughs> it, that's wonderful. One of the things that some realtors use that you might want to think about is they do these sort of like virtual walkthroughs where it's as if you're walking through the physical space. Um, they do that to sell houses, but it's certainly something that I think you've, I've seen some museums do, and it might entice people to look at it and get the feel of walking through so that then they then will uh, want to come in and actually step We do have it. one of those, actually. It is on our website, so we do have things like that. All but right. we'll build more, absolutely. Maybe uh, uh, the, my previous speaker it might be a, a person to talk to as well. <laughs> so <laughs> not, just, not just Revolutionary War, right? All right, good. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you very much for Thank your you. testimony you today. Much. Jill Sellers, President and CEO of Main Street Gettysburg. If you want to come up and provide your testimony. Thank you, Jill. Good afternoon. Jill Sellers, president of Main Street Gettysburg. Um, Main Street Gettysburg is a 501c3. We were founded in 1984, and we are the economic development and historic preservation champion of the borough of Gettysburg. Um, 
Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. We are now engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for the men who gave their lives here that that nation might endure. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead that struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but they will never forget what they did here. It is us for living, the living rather to be dedicated to the unfinished work for which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that these honored dead, we take the increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here are highly resolved that these dead have not have, shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a birth a new birth of freedom, that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Um, Gettysburg is recognized, as my colleague before me uh, noted, as a turning point in the Civil War. Gettysburg's uh, famous address delivered November 1863 uh, essentially cemented us as a destination for learning, uh, for reflection, and uh, that has continued for the last 160 years. Um, we are approaching this in Adams County as a collective. Uh, our local commission is very active uh, in the 250 plans, and we feel very tied to America 250 PA as Philadelphia reflects on the birth of the nation, we reflect on the new birth of our freedoms. Those connections, I think, are really valuable in telling the story of our survival. And I think as we talk about uh, the, the harder parts of our history, we are looking to preserve that through the project that I, present, that I have uh, submitted for today, and that is the Gettysburg Welcome Center project. Uh, this project will be located in the heart of our downtown. We have not had a welcome center in the heart of Gettysburg in over 20 years. For a destination that hosts up to three million or more people a year as it is, this is a phenomenal lack of resources in our downtown for the people that come to learn, reflect, um, from school children to bus groups. And uh, it, so where we are with this project at, uh, at this time is we are um, organized with partners, the fabric of our community. So uh, the borough of Gettysburg, Main Street Gettysburg, Destination Gettysburg as our uh, destination marketing organization, Adams County Historical Society, the Gettysburg Foundation, and the National Park Service. We're talking with all of these partners uh, with plans to develop this property. The property itself is donated, so we, are, we have a location um, already that's ready to, uh, that is shovel ready at this point. We have an architect engaged. We have plans that are in your packet and we are taking steps to uh, cement that opportunity for us to be able to greet visitors from Pennsylvania and around the world uh, so that we can take, uh, take them into the borough and explain uh, and give access to the history that, that founded us and preserved us so that we can celebrate the 250th in 2026. Ms. Sellers, thank you very, very much. Um, thank you. As my colleagues will tell you, I'm parochially very, very pro York County, but uh, Gettysburg holds a special place. I know for a fact mm -hmm. that my third great grandfather was there and injured. Um, and so it does hold a special meaning, not only for this nation, but personally. Um, 
it really means a lot. I'm going to open it up to my colleagues for questions. Representative Kim. Thank you, Jill Sellers, for your testimony. I'm very surprised that Gettysburg doesn't have a welcome center. Uh, what do you think, softball question, that it would help with economic development if you have a one-stop shop and showing and sharing all the amenities of Gettysburg? The, the critical, uh, one of the critical elements of this program and this project is its location. It's, it's completely centered in the heart of our historic district. The historic district is less than a mile wide, and it, this, is, this is ideally located between Lincoln Square and Steinware Avenue. Steinware Avenue is where the National Military Park Museum had been located up until 2008. Uh, that is now out on the Baltimore Pike, which is a wonderful facility that we work closely with, but it is not a walkable district uh, anymore because of that. So we're looking to provide information, amenities, access to local transportation, increased multi multimodal opportunities for people so they can spend uh, time in the heart of downtown, and it's definitely an economic lift to tie those business districts together. Thank you. Thank you. Members, further questions? Um, thank you very much. If you want to see the old map, that's now in Hanover in York County, Pennsylvania. Correct. So. Um, a lot of shared history there. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank you, committee. Our next testifier today is Mark Platts. He is the president of the Susquehanna National Heritage Area. And Mark, please begin when you are ready. sure whether I wear my reading glasses so I can read this or my, prog my progressive lenses so I can see you. So I'm going to try the progressives. <laughs> so, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm Mark Platts, president of Susquehanna National Heritage Area uh, in York and Lancaster counties. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of an exciting project to create a new heritage tourism destination and bring jobs and economic development to our region. Susquehanna National Harry Jerry is a nonprofit organization, uh, been in existence for 20 years. We're charged with managing Pennsylvania's 10th state heritage area and America's 55th national heritage area, covering all of York and all the Lancaster counties. Our mission is to connect the people and communities of our heritage area to one another and the nation through stories about our nationally important place. And much of our work focuses on the Susquehanna River's scenic and historic landscapes and communities. We are based at the Zimmerman Center for Heritage, which is a historic 1750s home and visitor education center near Wrightsville on the York County shore, where we also offer river discovery tours aboard our 1912 wooden electric boat, which senator, the senator knows well. <laughs> so, um, we also manage Columbia Crossing River Trail Center on Columbia's riverfront, and will soon acquire the historic Mifflin House and Farm near the river in Wrightsville which is an underground railroad and Civil War heritage site that is the subject of this grant proposal. The Mifflin Farm will be redeveloped as the Susquehanna Discovery Center and Heritage Park, a new gateway visitor destination for our two county, state, and national heritage area. We've been working since 2017 with Preservation Pennsylvania and the Conservation Fund and local community organizations and, and individuals to save the Mifflin site from advancing warehouse development. And I'm pleased to share that last year the conservation purchased the site for $5.25 million with funding from its National Revolving Fund and Pennsylvania DCNR grants. In October, our organization will purchase it from the Conservation Fund to repay the Revolving Fund with public and private foundation grants already awarded or pledged to complete the acquisition phase of the project, which we expect to do again this year. Redevelopment of the site is the big lift. Um, and it will be implemented in four phases over five to seven years at a projected total cost of about $18 million. This includes redevelopment of the main barn, uh, which dates to 1850, parts of it, and 1940 for another part of it. Uh, as a visitor, welcome and education facility, restoration of Mifflin House as an underground railroad learning center, and enhancement of the historic landscape as a heritage park 
with interpretive trails to the riverfront and a paddle craft access area on the river. An eight acre parcel is reserved for future hospitality development to bring economic investment to the historic river town of Wrightsville uh, and also hopefully create an endowment fund for operation of the facility. Our America 250 request for $850,000 will supplement other federal, state, and private funds to finance the second phase of the project after acquisition, which is a $5.1 million design and construction phase um, that includes renovation of part of the historic barn complex to serve as initial program exhibit and office space, along with site infrastructure, walkways, outdoor spaces, and parking. This will enable initial interpretive features of the project to be finished and open to the public in time for, I'm going to call it the 250th celebration instead of the other thing, um, in 2026. Um, we're doing all this because this place really matters. The history and events associated with the Mifflin site in the 19th century exemplify the core principles of, and ideals of freedom and equality that were so essential to America's founding, yet remained so out of reach for many black Americans for generations to come. Throughout the early 1800s, the Mifflin House was a safe haven for black se freedom seekers passing through central Pennsylvania. The Mifflin family and fellow Quakers and white and black residents of the river towns of our area were active in the Underground Railroad throughout the early 19th century, with the Mifflin House serving as an important station in the clandestine network. The Susquehanna River was a natural barrier to migration for freedom seekers, and the covered bridge at Wrightsville was the only crossing between Maryland and Harrisburg. With the assistance excuse me, of the Mifflins and others, those escaping slavery found safe passage over the bridge or across the river by boat. One trusted partner with the Mifflins was Robert Loney, a skilled black boatsman from Columbia who had been born enslaved in Virginia and ferried people across the river to avoid enslavers at the bridge. This is a nationally documented uh, important role of the Underground Railroad on this site, but it also was a Civil War battle site. So we, we actually covered two key parts of the, the struggle for freedom. In 1863, just before the burning of the bridge to stop Confederate invaders from crossing into Lancaster County, there was a battle on part of this property. Uh, 3,000 Confederate troops had marched through York, were trying to take the bridge and move on, and they were re repelled partially at the site and then finally stopped when the bridge was burned to stop their advancement. These historical events, Underground Railroad, Civil War, were essential parts of the larger American struggle to achieve its founding ideals, even in the face of rancorous debate and the eventual armed conflict of the Civil War. This landscape and the house were at the center of history. We think it really fits what you're trying to do uh, with this program. And we thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, and present information uh, about the project. I have to thank you very much. And as Representative Kim shared, it's hard not to be biased. It's a little hard for me not to be biased about um, this one as well. Um, appreciate all of the work that you have done. Um, we almost lost this um, to the bulldozer. Um, so what the Susquehanna National Heritage Area has done for this is really significant, not in your original mission or charge, but certainly. Yeah, we were just trying um, to save the place, and now we're going <laughs> to be doing it. You, <laughs> you have really um, taken on a great challenge, but a very worthy challenge, and we're very grateful for that. Um, members? Questions, Representative or Senator Street. Um, I just want to um, uh, commend the work. I think preserving um, the history, particularly around the under underground railroad, which is so many of those sites are often lost. Uh, I think is yeah. um, is very important um, and important in telling the true story of the significance that Pennsylvanians had, and um, <clears throat> you know how so many people um, ended up where they are, were. Uh, you know, the and many of the people crossing there went to Philadelphia. Yeah, they could be safe there. Yeah, they yeah. they did with the um, the you know the end of the underground railroad for many people being Mother Bethel. Um, have you um, explored some of the connections between the two? Um, we've really uh, at the early stages of this, so we've been really trying to mostly focus on the connections to some of the York and Lancaster underground yeah. railroad sites. Uh, so we have representatives from the Goodridge Center in, in uh, York uh, on our task force that's working with us. And we're engaging folks from Lancaster uh, to, uh, because Lancaster played a key role with Thaddeus Stevens and, and some of the history there, as well as the Christiana 
uh, revolt uh, in Lancaster County. We haven't gone much beyond that at this point, uh, but obviously this site uh, is part of a much broader network and, and we need to connect to all the places where folks came from and where they were heading to. Absolutely, look, I think it's, it's wonderful. Um, you might want to consider reaching out to the folks at the AME Church and Mother Bethel because they have um, a tremendous archive of records related to the Underground Railroad, and I'm sure some of it um, would help you document some of the things that happened at this site. I think it's great, great work. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any further questions? Representative Solomon. The budget is, is, is big, right? 21, over 21 million, and yeah. you're only asking us for 850. If, if that were awarded, is there a particular area that we could fund where we would kind of get the most bang for our buck in anticipation of 2026? Yes. Uh, yeah, we, we would happily take more. <laughs> but we were trying to focus on the phase of the project that would, could most feasibly done, be done by 2026. So I don't know if you have the detailed budget that we submitted with the application, but phase two of that project is about a $5.1 million piece of it. And it includes the initial renovation of about half of the dairy barn complex for the initial public program space, exhibit space, uh, for us to have a presence on the site and then do a lot of the exterior work. And we have uh, $3 million of Pennsylvania RACP funding already committed to that. We currently have a congressionally directed spending request that's been included in the Senate Appropriations Bill in Washington for another million dollars. Uh, and we have $250,000 of grants to do the master plan. So we were looking at that remaining 850000 to complete phase two as our request to you. Uh, but we got phase three, four, and five, too. <laughs> so, but they're going to probably not be developed until uh, after 2026. Further questions? Mark, thank you very much. Great. Appreciate thank your you. testimony here today. And I didn't need the reading glasses. <laughs> Seth Knoll, VP of Operations, Northern Central Railway of York. When you're ready, please provide your testimony. Thanks so much. I'd like to thank the committee for taking the time to hear our testimony. Uh, we are based in New Freedom, Pennsylvania, Northern Central Railway, uh, formerly known as Steam into History, is a 501c3 educational nonprofit located in southern, the southern end of your county. Our mission is to enhance the economic engine of your county by delivering entertaining, historical, and educational experiences on an excursion railway. Organizational goals are to provide rail-based, uh, multi-generational entertainment experiences, educational rides uh, regarding U.S. and local history, inspiring interest in rail history, and promoting York County's economic development through increased tourism. We host adults, train, and railway enthusiasts, history buffs, photograph OTs, families seeking wholesome entertainment, natural enthusiasts, and sightseers. On any weekend at NCR, you can see Abraham Lincoln to Santa Claus. We're a part of the arts and cultural program and one of the key tourist attractions for the county. In 2020, NCR became a trail-friendly business uh, designated by YCEA's Trail Towns, and we like to think of ourselves as the line that joins the trail towns together. In fact, NCR is viewed as an anchor business in four out of the five boroughs located along the trail and provides tourist passengers and economic impact to the partnering trail towns. In June, we celebrated our 10th anniversary, and by the end of 2023 season, we will have hosted over 200,000 passengers from all over the country, or all over the world, including 48 U.S. states. NCR programming thrives on celebrating milestones and history and making memories and family traditions. Celebrating the 250th anniversary in 2026 will be a key theme in our yearly program offerings. As you can imagine, running a tourist railroad can be a very expensive endeavor. Between tickets, sales, and third-party support, NCR covers our general operations. We have received grant funding from several of your 
county community associations such as Explore York, the Cultural Alliance, uh, Community Foundation, and Economic Alliance over the years. One of the most expensive line items, though, for us is track operation and maintenance and 100% necessary for our business. Today, NCR is requesting $250,000 for the historic track stabilization project. The historic Northern Central Railway track stabilization impacts has been designed to ensure that track on which our train runs are Federal Railway Administration or FRA compliant, uh, acquainted for the trains of the NCR operation and safety for our riders. And a project like this will meet federal regulations. Uh, it will also stabilize track and increase safety, enhance passenger safety and improve accessibility, increase programming opportunities by extending operations, and improve customer experience. There are four main areas that we have listed in our proposal that we would like to work on, one in New Freedom Borough, one in Railroad Borough, one in Shrewsbury Township, and one in Condoris Township. New Freedom Borough is a passing track of approximately 2,500 lineal feet, which will give us the opportunity to run two different train excursions at the time, same time by utilizing that track. In railroad, we're looking to stabilize a entrance to a new business, uh, aircraft, and it will give our persons a, another destination along the, the trail and also help support local business. In the Shrewsbury Township area, the Sightslin, uh, we have bridge approaches that we'd like to work on, mostly because this is a historic rail line and part of the Pennsylvania Railroad. It was made for high-speed operations. We moved 10 to 15 miles an hour. So think of uh, somebody trying to go around a NASCAR track on a, uh, an incline, and that's basically what you have on many of our, our areas, which is why the fourth project is in Sightsland, and that's known as super elevation. We want to remove that, flatten the tracks, and again, give our customers a better experience. So why is this all important? Well, railroading itself developed the industrial uh, portion of America and it has contributed greatly to the America that we live in today. Uh, because of this, uh, many of the towns that you see today are what I would call disconnected from the rest of the transportation system, and that is mainly boroughs. Many of those boroughs are in areas that you wouldn't expect. By getting on the train, we bring people into those areas that they typically wouldn't just pass through. We're also bringing people back uh, to areas uh, where they can experience residential life uh, in Pennsylvania and look back at our origins. We're also preserving the rail corridor for future use, not only as passenger, but the ability to do something beyond that. We also want to push our programs uh, for youth and education, STEM or STEAM programs that we use. So all of these combined are the reasons why we're seeking this funding. Seth, thank you very much. If you haven't been to the Northern Central Rail, you should really check it out. Um, and one of the things that I think is so amazing, and again, I'm a little biased, but you know, Ms. Sellers, um, she, she spoke very eloquently those words of Abraham Lincoln. There's a, he was a really important passenger on your railway. Can you talk a little bit about how the Northern Central Railway um, impacted the Battle of Gettysburg and the Civil War. Yeah, Northern Central, uh, Lincoln traveled to the White House and unfortunately upon his death, uh, the reverse trip with his uh, funeral train, but he also rode that in the middle going to Gettysburg to give the Gettysburg Address, which was uh, so eloquently talked about earlier. And it was a vital artery for troop movements uh, throughout the Civil War through uh, supplies and other things that supplied the, uh, the armies of the North. So it was a very active and very important railway during the entire conflict. I appreciate that very much. My understanding, if I'm correct, was that 22 bridges were destroyed, that those who were wounded had to stay in Gettysburg until they could repair those 22 bridges. They did it in less than one week, and that became the main artery to remove all the wounded um, to hospitals to care from them. Yeah. Am I re re remembering that correctly? That is correct. Uh, the Hanover Branch Rail uh, Line, which is right at Hanover Junction, which is where the, uh, the famous photo of Abraham Lincoln on the line is, uh, is located, uh, it's amazing the amount of things that, that happened, and you're correct. People were moved to York, Pennsylvania, to Philadelphia, to Baltimore. The wounded from both sides uh, traveled and traversed that line. 
the project, um, you've hit key train stops and, and sites. Um, is this a scalable project? Um, could they be prioritized and taken on um, individually? Yes, absolutely. And if you see the budget that we put in there, we broke our $250,000 request into four specific projects for that very reason uh, to make sure that uh, if there was an opportunity for funding for everything, that there would be at least some opportunity for funding for certain projects. The first one is really our number one priority, the passing track. And the second one would be to gain access, uh, really because of the economic development and railroad, being able to create a secondary stop uh, to give persons on the train yet another experience uh, for the tourists and the persons uh, who are attending. Thank you very much. Um, any further questions from members? Very good. Thank you very much for your testimony. Yeah. Thank you so much. Our next testifier today is Christine Turner. She, she is the executive director and David Beiser, uh, president of the board of directors of the Historical Society of Dauphin County. We very much appreciate your attire here today, Mr. Beiser, and uh, you may proceed with your testimony when you are ready. Well, I thank you most kindly, madam, and, and uh, good day gentlemen and ladies. I come to you as someone who has arrived back from 250 years ago. My good father founded um, uh, the ferry boat upon the river and uh, when upon his own death uh, all of that came to my ownership. And so uh, upon this opportunity I wish to say to you just a few things because I would imagine at this point you, uh, you're finding yourself in a bit of uh, overload. But I do appreciate the, the traverse from Philadelphia. I, last time, I, my horse threw two shoes coming out of town. I do appreciate it. Uh, I visited Congress in York and, of course, founded Dolphin County. And so uh, I do have a relationship with, I think, each one of you. Not long ago, we even dedicated a, a, a gravesite together uh, in, um, in our fabulous county. So uh, we did build house. My father did build house upon the river and uh, upon his death, we decided to uh, build a new house. And there upon that home, we've made a decision that uh, each year upon, uh, up upon the, the 4th of July that we would read the declaration from the front porch of our house. We did it the first time in 76 upon the request of Congress itself. The Congress had requested at that moment that the declaration be read from pulpits, from saddles of generals, and from front porches in every location possible. So we did choose to do that there upon the frontier on the Susquehanna River. And so having done so, I, I find myself in great connection with your striving to celebrate that moment in history 250 years ago. In, in the days before 1776, my heart was divided. I was a fine British subject. But having received the news uh, from the Pennsylvania Gazette out of Philadelphia, and having read this document upon my own front porch, uh, I committed there 3,000 pounds of my own money, the ready money that we had in my home and both of my sons to service as well as myself being made a, a captain in the, in the uh, Continental Army. There being a uh, recruiter and supply agent from the frontier, we made it possible for service to be had among our patriot soldiers. In the summer of 76, residents gathered around my home for the very first time to hear this document, in which my heart was uniquely stirred in hearing the words that we should pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And so, having laid that document before all of us, we present ourselves before you that you might help us continue to present this document and history to our community. Madam Turner. Thank you. Today, hundreds of people still gather around John Harris Jr.'s por porch every July 4th to hear the Declaration of Independence read out loud. For many, it is the first time they have, they have heard the words, just like all of those people 247 years ago. The Historical Society of Dauphin County is dedicated to the preservation of local history and the education of the public. 
founded in 1869, we are one of the oldest historical societies in Pennsylvania. Our mission is to collect, preserve, exhibit, publish, and promote interest in the history of Dauphin County for the education, enjoyment, and benefit of the public. We fulfill this mission in a variety of ways using a small staff, many dedicated volunteers, and limited financial resources. Our first priority is the preservation of the John Harris Simon Cameron Mansion. Built in 1766, the mansion is a National Historic Landmark that is open year-round for guided tours, school group visits, programs, and events. The Historical Society also operates the Alexander Research Library and Archives, which is a treasure trove of local history available to the public. We also offer educational programs, including lectures, workshops, exhibits, and events for residents and visitors to our community. As you can see, our mission closely aligns with America 250 PA's EPIC campaign team. We are respectfully requesting $150,000 to assist us in our mission to restore and preserve the John Harris Simon Cameron Mansion and grounds. These funds will enable us to preserve the porch where the declaration was read, restore the ornamental ironwork fencing that surrounds the mansion, repair and make handicap accessible all the brick sidewalks on and surrounding the property, install museum quality lighting in the mansion, restore the doors in the mansion, and create and install signage informing visitors of the site's connection to the founding of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in America. Harris Jr. founded Harrisburg with an incredible amount of vision. He ensured that the residents of this area were of all that was occurring at the beginning of America's founding. He strongly believed that Harrisburg could set the pace for the rest of the state. If we could call people back to connecting with that original sense of vision and adventure, what Harrisburg, Pennsylvania and America really could become is unlimited. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, questions? Representative Kim. Senator, I have to challenge your unbiasedness with your county. So you opened the doors. This is in my district. This is Dauphin County, and they do an amazing job in terms of educating people. You started the Senator. So um, I've heard Mr. Beiser, Pastor Beiser speak. Um, the kids are engaged, um, and it is an important house. Harrisburg obviously is the capital. We don't know our story as much. Um, and even I, I wonder if the reps and senators know why it's called Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So I just want to put it out there that they do an excellent job. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> that door is always open, Representative Kim. Any further questions? Impressive. <laughs> very good. Thank you so much thank for your you. testimony today. Call up C.J. Weigel, director, shocking another York County proposal. York County Rail Trail Authority. C.J., welcome. Please give us your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is C.J. Weigel, and I currently serve on the York County Rail Trail Authority Board. On behalf of our organization, we want to thank you for having us today. Today, my testimony will make the case for funding to build a section of the locally and regionally important Hanover Trolley Trail, which links together revolutionary period sites and stories, and will provide a platform for the 250th anniversary visitors to explore the history and culture of southeastern York County. Our story is one of humble beginnings, much like the founding of this nation. Our small county of York has been front and center to much of our nation's history, and at its center lie York City and Hanover, both major urban centers who share a storied past. These historical accounts include the site of McAllister's Tavern in Hanover, where Benjamin Franklin stayed in 1755 on a mission to get munitions for the French and Indian War. Hanover lays claim to the site where the nation's first female war correspondent lived and worked, Mary Shaw Leader, and who could forget Reinecker's Tavern, where a young Thomas Jefferson stayed in April of 1776 on his way to Philadelphia to pen the Declaration of Independence. York and Hanover both share one of their most famous guests, President Abraham Lincoln, who spoke to townsfolks on his way to Gettysburg to deliver the world-famous Gettysburg Address, where he took none other than the exact rail line our completed Heritage Rail Trail currently exists. The Hanover Trolley Trail expansion also celebrates Pennsylvania's rail history. This project is the adaptive reuse of two rail lines, the York and Hanover Frederick Railroad and the York Hanover Trolley Line. The railroad's history included the innovation of luxurious Pullman parlor cars in 1902 and gas electric car service in 1924. The authority's mission is to enhance the lives of York Countyans and nearby communities as well as visitors from near and far. 
Since its formation in 1990, our organization has garnered over $17 million to build over 30 miles of multi-use trails in York County. We have established a record of success in rail trail development that will extend to providing a truly unique legacy project for America's 250th anniversary. I would say our past certainly demonstrates this. The York County Rail Trail Authority is a municipal authority formed under the Pennsylvania Municipal Authorities Act of 1945. The authority was created by the York County Board of Commissioners in 1990 to develop a network of public multi-use trails utilizing and repurposing neglected, unused, bygone railroad beds and utility corridors. Our project is to construct a three-mile section of the Hanover Trolley Trail, a multi-use rail trail that will connect York County's two urban centers of Hanover and York City. This project is an excellent representation of 250 years of American history because one, it is integral to the completion of the Grand History Trail, two, it tells the story of the everyday transportation of people, raw materials, and goods, three, it honors the proud history of two rail lines, and four, it responds to today's popular demand for multi-use rail trails. Should this project be funded, we would expect completion by July 4, 2026. What better way to celebrate 250 years of American history than by completing a project that connects our roots to our next unwritten 250 years? The Hanover Trolley Trail is an integral part of a larger trail network, the Grand History Trail, a proposed circular corridor to connect important heritage sites, such as the National Mall in Washington, D.C., the historic town of Harpers Ferry, Gettysburg National Military Park, and other national landmarks. Of the Grand History Trail's 250 miles, approximately half are already completed. This project is a major step toward completing the Hanover Trolley Trail, and as such, a key component to closing the Grand History Trails gap between York, Hanover, and Gettysburg. As the authority works with the many Grand History partners from Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, and Washington, D.C., to close the remaining gaps in the trail network, the Hanover Trolley Trail will be elevated from a locally used recreational trail to become part of a recreational trail system linking our national history from its birth in York to its struggles in Gettysburg, Frederick, and Annapolis, to its transportation along the CNO Canal in Baltimore Harbor, and to its grand memorials in Washington, D.C. Lastly, this project exemplifies today's adaptive reuse of rail lines and to meet a growing demand for off-road multi-use trails that began in the 1970s. The pandemic of 2020 brought unprecedented numbers of Pennsylvanians to our parks and trails for respite, rest, and relaxation. This project responds to today's realization that outdoor recreation is not more than an afterthought. Rather, outdoor recreation is essential. This project celebrates our past, responds to our present, and brightens our future. Thank you. CJ, thank you so much. Um, this obviously is scalable based on the financials that you have submitted. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that could be done that partially implemented? Um, we're looking at um, an unknown amount of money. Some will be appropriated from tax dollars. Uh, much could be raised through um, private philanthropy. Um, is this a scalable project? Sure, absolutely. So for context, it costs about, give or take, depending on inflation, $800,000 per one mile. So it is something that we are looking to do in three phases to connect what we currently have to bring York City into Hanover into the, uh, the Heritage Rail Trail. So yes, it could be a scalable project. And um, can you speak to the numbers of visitors on the Heritage Rail Trail? And um, I know you keep data. Where are folks coming from? Sure, absolutely. So we see thousands of visitors a year. Uh, outdoor recreation, not just specifically with rail trails, but in general, it's a billion dollar industry and it continues to grow. Uh, and it's something that we're very proud of. So our visitors come all over Pennsylvania. They come from Maryland, they come from DC, even some from West Virginia. Again, a part of that bigger grand history loop. We see folks from all over and we're very proud to, uh, to be a part of that uh, journey as they make their way in and through Pennsylvania. Very good. Well. Representative Kim, I, I don't want to disappoint you, but um, when city and state asked me how I was going to lose my COVID weight, I told them I'm going to walk the Heritage Trail, Heritage Rail Trail, and uh, eat lots of fresh York County produce, which I did and was able to take that COVID weight off. And with that, I'll turn it over to you for your questioning. That's kind of rude of city and state to ask that question, <laughs> but right? How about it, right? <laughs> CJ, thank you for your presentation. Um, I learned about the uh, Ben Franklin story. How is it uh, told now? And could you uh, work with the Vision Resources uh, solutions? 
to tell that story. How, how is that told to your tourists or residents about Benjamin Franklin at the tavern? Sure, so we have a couple of historical markers, ones that we're looking at getting repurposed, updating uh, the coloring and the imagery so that folks can see them when they're coming through. Uh, Hanover's a wonderful place to visit, unfortunately, unless you're traveling to Gettysburg or to York, it's not necessarily a destination town, and we believe that this is something that uh, would help folks either walking, biking, to, to be able to come into the downtown and take a look at some of the wonderful history. Uh, we do have some guided tours, and we do have uh, wonderful folks who are experts uh, in this topic locally, uh, but it is something that we would love to partner with. I, I loved the idea of the, of the virtual reality. I think that's wonderful. Uh, what a way to interact people in a whole new way, especially young children. I think that that would be great. Uh, so absolutely ways that we could partner and grow. And we're all here for the same thing, and I think that's one of the wonderful things to come out of these opportunities. Thank you, CJ. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Um, just, I, just to, I'm oh, Senator Street. Um, are you going to be wearing period clothes? I can absolutely do that. <laughs> <laughs> no further questions. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Um, you share that same right of way, the Heritage Rail Trail, with the Northern Central Rail. So you've co-located and, and work to share resources. Can you talk about how you can work together um, on, on future initiatives? Sure, so I actually think there was a, another group that provided testimony in York, uh, the Trail Towns Initiative. So when you talk about Northern Central, you talk about the Heritage Rail Trail and Trail Towns, we're all kind of operating within that same umbrella, trying to get folks to uh, enjoy what we have to offer. So that can be through funding opportunities, it promotes businesses, it promotes tourism, promotes job creation and growth. That's something that we continue to work towards uh, and something that we all like to partner in. And we're all trying to uh, achieve the same goal at the end of the day, which is to promote York County, our state's history and our nation's history. Uh, and we love partnering with folks. It's, it's absolutely a wonderful thing. It's great to collaborate and uh, happy to call them friends in this journey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for your testimony right. today. Our next testifier today is John Wessner from Old Bedford Village. Mr. Wessner, we welcome your testimony when you are ready. Good afternoon, members of the America 250 PA Infrastructure Improvements and Projects Committee. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share some information about Old Bedford Village. My name is John Wessner, and I am here to represent the village where I have served as a social media and digital volunteer for nearly 15 years. We are excited to partner with you as we prepare to celebrate America's semi-quincentennial. Old Bedford Village is a nonprofit early American village nestled in historic Bedford County, Pennsylvania. Our village was constructed in the early 1970s by moving several log homes from around the county and by reconstructing period-style buildings. Several of the relocated homes were originally built in the 18th and 19th century. Here we work to share the story of life in one of America's early frontier settlements. We represent what daily life would have looked like for people living in Pennsylvania from the mid-1700s through the turn of the 20th century. We share this story through the work of our dedicated staff and volunteers. We currently have one full-time and seven part-time employees. Additionally, we have approximately 25 dedicated volunteers who assist in various capacities. Additional volunteer living historians attend during event weekends, and together we take great pride in our ability to pass along our heritage and history to our visitors. This is especially true for the over 3,000 students who attend our hands-on field trip program annually. Outside of my volunteer work with Old Bedford Village, I am a fourth grade teacher and have seen firsthand the power of my students being able to engage with hands-on history experiences at the village over the years. My own connection to the village began as a 10-year-old fourth grade student in 1991. Visiting this amazing site is a large part of what sparked a lifelong love of history and learning for me as well as countless others. 
Old Bedford Village is a well-known destination that brings tourism income to our county throughout our many special events, as well as our day-to-day -day activities. Each year, we welcome over 30,000 guests who cross the Clayton Covered Bridge and enjoy a journey back in time. During their time in Bedford, our guests frequently visit our unique downtown specialty shops, restaurants, and other attractions. And they also sometimes stay in our nearby hotels and campgrounds, investing more into our local economy. We are also located on the newly constructed Schuster Way Heritage Trail, connecting us to the renowned Omni Bedford Springs Resort. Throughout the season, we offer opportunities for immersive multi-sensory history experiences through events such as our Civil War Living History and Reenactment, our 18th and 19th Century Living History Weekend, our Wild West Weekend, and our popular seasonal Murder Mystery and Candlelit Christmas Days. And while all of these events are family friendly, our Pioneer History Day Camp and our Pumpkin Fest put an increased focus on our youngest guests, as well as helping to, inst as well, helping to instill a lifelong interest and love of history. We're already looking forward to our 2026 operating season. Old Bedford Village originally opened on July 4th, 1976, which means our nation's 250th birthday will also be our village's 50th anniversary. We have become a multi-generational facility as people who attended during our early years have since returned with their children and now their grandchildren. We're in the early stages of planning a celebration that will offer free admission to our guests as we celebrate this incredible milestone for our country and our village. We look forward to celebrating with our guests from near and far and seek to position Old Bedford Village as a site that families can enjoy together for many years to come. But after f nearly 50 years, however, many of our historic buildings are in desperate need of attention. We're facing leaky roofs, warped floors, and bowed walls. Additionally, our parking areas and sewage system will soon require modern updates. If granted, these funds would be used to make extensive repairs and updates throughout the village. Through a revitalized and rejuvenated facility, we would work to encourage new volunteers to join us in our mission and could share with our guests our pride in a facility that is refreshed and well-maintained. We would also hope that this would help us to expand our use as an event rental facility. We currently offer rental of our facilities for weddings and other private events and would like to expand on these offerings. We would also incorporate these improvements into our marketing strategy as we encourage guests to celebrate America's 250th year with us during the 2026 season highlighting the updates that will make Old Bedford Village the region's premier historic site showcasing rural America's early history. Old Bedford Village is uniquely positioned to be a key location to celebrate Pennsylvania's heritage, innovation, work ethic, and spirit. We are excited to partner with America 250 PA to highlight all of the wonderful traditions that make us Pennsylvania proud. On behalf of all of us at Old Bedford Village, thank you very much for your time and consideration today. Thank you very much for your testimony. Members, questions? Representative Kim. So I did a little bit of research on Bedford County while mm -hmm. you were speaking, and you are experiencing a little bit of a depopulation. Um, you're, you're hovering right under 48,000. Uh, with these investments, um, how would you, how would this maybe enhance tax dollars, tourism dollars to your area? Sure, so it is our hope that we can continue to pull people from outside the area. Uh, Old Bedford Village, I had spoken to our direct Visitors Bureau Director, uh, he said it's one of the most prominent and requested attractions in the county, uh, that thousands of people each year call to inquire about the village, uh, that when people come to Bedford, many already are aware of the village before they arrive, uh, and then once they're there, they're they are frequent patrons at our other businesses. They go to our restaurants and we point them in those directions as well uh, to try to support the other areas of our county too. So. so there'll be a dual purpose in terms of celebrating the 250th anniversary while boosting economic development. We certainly hope so, county. yes. Great, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Any further questions from members? I always like to ask the question about scalability. Um, is this something that could be a phased in implementation and get you to where you need to be um, in 2026 to it attract is. visitors? Yeah. We hope so. Our first priority, our first and foremost priority would be the restoration of the buildings themselves. Uh, our costs cover our operation, but we often don't have a lot of disposable income to put into that improvement and in infrastructure of the village itself. 
So it's our hope we would start there and then hopefully be able to include those other projects, the parking areas and things for guest uh, comfort and accommodation as well. Very good. Our, when I think of Bedford, I think of the Whiskey Rebellion. Mm -hmm. Is there um, any work that connects the Bedford Village with some of the other historic events and, and activities yes. in the S county? Yeah, so we do have a Whiskey Rebellion display in the village. One of our buildings was recently transitioned to represent the Whiskey, whiskey Rebellion and the important things that happened there, uh, with General Washington being, Washington being the first sitting president to lead an army. Uh, but we do connect to the Bedford Springs, which also focuses a bit on that uh, Whiskey Rebellion tradition as well, and certainly are always looking to expand those offerings. Uh, we often have presentations during our 18th, 19th century Living History Weekend that focus on, on that era too. Very good, another pivotal moment that kept the, uh, the great nation together. So yes, thank indeed. you very much for your testimony here today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the time and the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Next up, we have Joe DeFrancesco, for Executive Director of Railroaders Heritage Corporation. Come on up, Joe. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present. I'm Joe DeFrancesco. I'm the executive director of the Railroaders War Museum in Altoona. We are requesting support for the operational restoration of Pennsylvania Railroad K4 steam locomotive, number 1361, built in 1918 in Altoona and today owned by the Railroaders Memorial Museum. The Railroaders Memorial Museum has a mission to preserve the legacy of railroaders who built Altoona Railroad City, a city founded in 1846 by the Pennsylvania Railroad specifically for the maintenance and construction of steam locomotives. The museum's interpretive center is housed in the historic 1880s Pennsylvania Railroad office building with the adjacent grounds housing a newly constructed roundhouse and railroad equipment display area. In addition to the downtown Altoona site, the museum operates the Horseshoe Curve National Historic Landmark. Visitors can watch modern day railroad operations on a route and right away in operation since 1854. We blend heritage with modern day operations with a focus on railroaders in central Pennsylvania. We tell the human story of railroading through programs and exhibits. We aspire to make K4 1361 a living history program that can travel the Commonwealth, engaging communities and linking them with their rich industrial past. K4-1361 is one of two surviving locomotives of a class of 425. The K4 class was developed from applied scientific research at the Pennsylvania Railroad's Altoona test plant. The K4 is the only surviving Pennsylvania Railroad steam locomotive to reside in Altoona out of over 8,000 8, locomotives constructed by Altoona workers. The K4 class of locomotive could be seen in virtually every corner of the Commonwealth, as well as over the Pennsylvania Railroad system, system spanning 13 states. The Pennsylvania Railroad was compelled to save K4 1361 and place on display at the Horseshoe Curve National Historic Landmark in 1957 as a tribute. Our new vision was developed by museum officials to create a mobile living history program centered around the K-4 being operational, enabling the locomotive to travel to Commonwealth, providing immersive experiences for school children, families, and enthusiasts. K-4-1361 will tell the story of a national state and of Altoona Railroaders a traveling museum that can visit regions of the state with programming to promote specific historical programs that will introduce the public to the life of railroaders, what railroaders did or what railroads did across the state and in local communities. 
The museum will partner with educational institutions to produce curriculum and content. The content of these programs will highlight broader national and commonwealth historical themes. The K-4 will be a time machine taking riders back in time to the 1950s, to a time when railroads were the primary means of travel prior to the construction of interstates. An example of what the Railroaders Memorial Museum is striving to accomplish is a Commonwealth-centric railroading experience comparable to that of the American Freedom Train created in 1976 for the Bicentennial. <clears throat> In 2019, FMW Solutions was hired to evaluate the condition of the locomotive and develop a plan to return it to operation. It was deemed possible after a comprehensive mechanical assessment was completed. A new effort of fundraising was launched in 2021 with the Railroaders More Museum. It was, was able to contract FMW Solutions to start the work. FMW Solutions and our team of professionals have continued to make progress since the renewed effort was launched with critical boiler work being completed and approximately $2 million needed to be raised to complete the K-4. FMW Solutions is also associated with numerous successful and professional steam locomotive operations throughout the U.S. K-4-1361 not only has a relevant and rich history, but is also a symbol of Pennsylvania carrying an iconic state emblems, such as a keystone-shaped number plate and Pennsylvania spelled out on the locomotive tender, thus making it a natural champion to promote and celebrate Pennsylvania in relation to America 250. K4-1361 merits support as it is the official state steam locomotive selected for its deep cultural heritage as it relates to the people of Pennsylvania and their contributions. It is a reminder of a people and a state at work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, questions for Mr. DeFrancesco? Very good. We All thank right. you very All much right. for your thank testimony you. today. Our next testifier is Kelly Schutz, Township Manager, and Donald Mortz, Derry Township, Mifflin County. And please begin your testimony when you are ready. <coughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to present our testimony regarding the Kishika Quillis Park Improvement Project. We are extremely excited to be here today. On behalf of Derry Township, I would like to thank the America 250 PA Infrastructure Improvements and Projects Committee, and in particular, uh, Representative Kim, Representative Solomon, Senator Phillips Hill, Director Pullman and Senator Street. I would like to introduce Mr. Donald Lawrence. He's our Vice Chairman of the Derry Township Board of Supervisors. And we also brought along Jenna Stoner uh, in the back of the room here from the Juniata River Valley Visitors Bureau. And she is the Mifflin County Representative on the America 250 PA County Advisory Committee. My name is Kelly Schutz. I'm the Township Manager for Derry Township. Derry Township, Mifflin County, not to be confused <laughs> with our much larger cousin Derry Township in Dauphin County, is seeking an America 250 PA grant to complete the Kishikaquillis Park Improvement Project. Kishikaquillis Park is a 47 acre park located in the heart of central PA. Kish Park, as the locals refer to it, has been in existence since 1900. It's widely believed that the park derived its name from the Kishikaquillis Creek running alongside it. The creek's name, coming from the chief of a Native American Shawnee tribe that inhabited the lands during the time of America's founding. The park grew to become an amusement park in the 1950s and thrived until the devastating flood in 1972 ended the recreational services the park provided. The park was purchased in 1974 
by Derry Township and, and was rescued from becoming a salvage yard. That 1974 Board of Supervisors had the foresight to know that our park, Kish Phyllis Park, was a unique part of local and American history that needed to be preserved. That brings us to the present time and to the present Board of Supervisors. In 2022, with the realization of how important the park is to the community, the Derry Township Board of Supervisors saw fit to develop a master plan to outline the future for the park. This master plan is the impetus to begin updating the aging infrastructure of the park. The park's 10 large picnic pavilions are reserved for family reunions, corporate picnics, school events, and Kish Park has been the site of the annual American Cancer Society Relay for Life weekend event for well over 20 years. The Mifflin Juniata Area Agency on Aging occupies the park to hold their senior games every June. Winter time does not close our park. The walking trails maintained throughout the winter months with snow and ice removal provided for those die-hired walkers and runners that brave the cold weather. Beginning in early November, many volunteers descend upon our park to begin to string holiday lights throughout. Known as Shining Light Through the Darkness, the event is reported to have as many as 15,000 vid visitors from all over our state during the month-long event. The project will directly affect Derry Township, but due to the wide use of the park, all the municipalities in Mifflin County are affected and many more access the park by bike or automobile as far away as Juniata County. Mifflin County has one of the lowest per capita income levels in our state. The Trust for Public Land 10 minute walk analysis showed that there are areas of Derry Township that have a high need for access to recreation. The township's efforts will assist in erasing the inequities for disadvantaged neighborhoods and create a much needed recreational opportunities for all. Derry Township is seeking an America 250 PA grant to install two new playgrounds, splash pad, ADA parking areas, and restroom facilities, and to rehabilitate the one mile, one mile walking trail and the aging mini golf course. Each one of these four segments of the project is shovel ready. The township is seeking funds to use as a match to a PA BCNR grant and a Pennsylvania local share, ground, share account grant with a total project cost of over $2.5 million, we would be appreciated to be awarded the $1 million to help close the gap in funding. The, this community park project will align with the America 250 PA platforms and will truly make 2026 epic in Mifflin County. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Members, questions? Director Coleman. So I'm gonna be biased here for just a second. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a former borough mayor. I just want to thank you. I know what it goes into to be a borough manager, a township manager. So thank you for your work day in and day out. And thank you for, for your public service as well. Um, what is the population of, of Derry Township? Uh, Derry Township is 7,212 people. Mifflin County as a whole is a little over 46,000. Okay, and actually piggybacking off of the Senator's usual questions, the, the budgets that you did submit are scalable, correct? Uh, yeah, we can we could scale it. We we hope to seek some other funding as well, but this grant would be, uh, you know, really the icing on the cake to finish it by 2026. Got it. Well, thank you again for your work, Representative Solomon. Thanks, Senator. Um, the Native American uh, history part it seemed mm -hmm. very interesting. I, I didn't know that history. Is that told at all in the park, or is there any? Uh, uh, I have been working with DCNR. Um, they suggested that we get some funding to go to the PA Historical um, Preservation Department and get some placards, and, and that's right. one of the things on my docket to do. Could some of this money be used to do that? Of course. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Any further questions from members? Well, I understand why you've nicknamed it Kish Park <laughs> because we struggle to say semi-quincentennial <laughs> and this is Kisha Coquillis. I say that three times fast. Right. So thank you so much for being here today and providing your testimony. Okay. Thank you. Glenn Nelson, Director of the County of Blair. For, <laughs> help me with this, yeah, what? Robodeau. Robodeau. Yeah. Thank you so much. Glenn, when you're ready, please provide your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are pleased to be here and thank you for this opportunity with the America 250 PA Infrastructure Improvement and Project Committee for the opportunity to share the legacy of Fort Roberto to the independence of America. Fort Roberto is a national historical site and a Blair County Park. I am the director, Glenn Nelson. That was a Emily Deffenbaugh that passed out the packets and we also have AC Stickle who is the chair for 250 America PA in Blair County as our guest today. Fort Roberto illustrates the story of American independence as the lead mine fort. General Roberto from Philadelphia led an expedition into Sinkin Springs Valley to build a fort for the purpose of protecting a lead mining and smelting operation. This effort, this was an effort to gain independence from relying on British supply musket balls and rifle slugs as we were a colony. The king was not too keen on sending such supplies after the direct declaration of independence. Fort Roberto was built in the spring of 1778 to house the Bedford militia in the county and as well as rangers on the frontier. So we were a lead mining and smelting operation and we actually advertised in the York Dispatch for uh, a smelter. Fort Roberto legacy tells the story of the ultimate sacrifice of American independence, the massacre of the Holiday family. William Holiday was garrisoned at the fort. He left the safe haven to harvest crops and grains in what is now the Gettysport section of present day Hollidaysburg. He took along his children to help with the harvest. Tragically, they were suddenly attacked by a raiding party. William Holiday lost his children in the effort to harvest a winter food supply for the fort, the ultimate sacrifice for American independence. The original fort information comes from two primary sources, a letter from General Robodeau to General Washington, June 4th, 1778, and the Columbian Magazine article in December, 1788. The fort served as a regional military garrison until late 1780 but remained a safe haven for frontier settlers until the early 1800 when the grounds became plowed under for farming. So think of that as Fort Roberto version 1.0. In the early 1900s, there was archeological digs supported by the Civilian Con Conservation Corps rediscovered the remains of the fort at its revolutionary purpose. During the late 1930s, there was an initial effort to reconstruct the fort as a tourist destination, but plans were halted due to World War II. With the bicentennial approaching, there was a second effort to reconstruct Fort Roberto, led by the Blair County chapter of the Sons of American Revolution. Blair County commissioners agreed to clear the site with the intention of making the fort a historical tourist attraction in time for the 1976 bicentennial, Fort Roberto version 2.0. Fort Roberto was added to the Historic Places Registry in May 1974 and reconstructed as a bicentennial project in 1976. Ironically, the restoration project was completed the spring 1978, 200 years later. Today, 47 years later, Fort Roberto still serves Pennsylvania and the United States as an historical site, tourist destination, and an educational focal point of the American Revolution. We are asking for your consideration to help generously support our effort by investing in the Fort Roberto infrastructure 
to better present the story of American independence well in the future to keep American history alive. For nearly a half century, hundreds of Fort volunteers have staff have dedicated their time, knowledge, frontier skills, and educational abilities to provide educational tours. In 2022, we had 34 different schools with over 2,000 students. And for um, that time period, we have never spent a dime or any time to recruit the schools. It's all by wor word of mouth. We have several projects listed for the future, Fort Cabin, Fort Pound, four pound cannons, restoration of our 19th century barn, slit rail fence, and such. Um, there's an itemized budget there if anybody has any questions after the presentation. But we had documented pension veterans that served at Fort Roverdale, keeping American history alive. Thank you. Thank you very much. I always appreciate the time I get to spend in Blair County, Holidaysburg, with your state senator, Judy Ward. Yes, thank you. Um, it really is beautiful, and I didn't know the history of how Holidaysburg acquired its name, so yes. thank you for sharing that. Members, uh, questions for Mr. Nelson? Your, your testimony here today has been very complete. Appreciate how you itemized each, and um, clearly it appears that it is a scalable project, and uh, thank you yes, you're very welcome. much. And our final testifier today is Mr. James Lowe. He is chairman of the board of directors of the Blair County Historical Society. Um, you are last, but certainly not least. <laughs> and we Good welcome your testimony when you are ready. Okay, thank you and good afternoon. My name is Jim Lowe. I recently retired as an American history teacher after 33 years. I was Pennsylvania History Teacher of the Year. And now my passion is to help the public learn about our local history and preserve that local history. I currently serve on our county's semi-quincentennial committee and I volunteer at Blair County Historical Society where I'm a member of the board and I'm the director of the board of directors. Blair County Historical Society was founded in 1906 and we currently operate a museum. We have an archives for the county's history. We conduct um, public events and activities and we issue publications on local history. Blair County has a rich history that parallels the history of the United States. In 1776, we were the frontier. We had a single trading post that provided material for settlers moving west. A few years later, we had a lead mine open to provide George Washington with the ammunition he needed to fight for independence. In the 19th century, iron furnaces sprung up across our county fueling the Industrial Revolution, providing the best iron in the country. 20 years after that, your predecessors, the Pennsylvania legislature chose Blair County as one of the sites for the mainline canal, improving transportation and bringing the transportation revolution to Blair County. It included the engineering marvel of using inclines to get the canal boats over the mountain, overcoming that obstacle. 20 years later, the Pennsylvania Railroad came to Blair County and built the largest railroad facilities in the world, as well as the world famous Horseshoe Curve. Again, overcoming the obstacle of the Allegheny Mountains. In 1862, the significance of Blair County was noted when the governors of the Northern states gathered in Blair County to decide, should we continue to support Abraham Lincoln and the war effort? They chose to vote to do so and to support his Emancipation Proclamation. Imagine how history would be different today for the United States if the Northern governors said we are no longer going to support this war effort. Our county's history continued to parallel the history of the United States for the next 150 years. And that's what we celebrate and will continue to celebrate, especially in the year 2026, for that special anniversary. Now, I mentioned the iron industry. Elias and Hetty Baker came to Blair County and operated the Allegheny Furnace. They built Baker Mansion from 1845 until 1849. The Greek Revival style mansion with 35 rooms serves as our headquarters today for our museum and for our archives. And that is why I'm here today. If you recognize the names 
Hetty and Elias Baker, by the way, they're sort of well known today because they are characters in the CBS television show Ghost. For us at Baker Mansion, though, it's more about the history. And we seek to um, gain your approval for a grant to improve our infrastructure. We have, over the last 20 years, meticulously restored the interior of the mansion by taking the rooms back to the condition they were in during the time the Bakers lived there. We struggle, though, to continually raise money. We've raised over a million dollars for those projects. We need some help with our infrastructure. So we look to restore the limestone facade of the building, which is 175 years old, and with 175 years of hot summers and cold winters in Pennsylvania, the facade has worn and needs restoration. It's a building that everyone in the county recognizes as the most recognizable facility. Uh, it's hard to find somebody that doesn't have wedding pictures there, prom pictures, graduation pictures. It's really an icon of the county and a gem of tourism. We also look to um, improve our facility in terms of installing a new roof to protect our archives that are on the third floor. We'd like to improve our sidewalk and driveway that are respectively 50 and 100 years old to have better accessibility for the 2026 celebration and to improve our HVAC system, which is inefficient and does not provide adequate um, uh, climate control for the preservation of our artifacts. With that, we would be able to um, secure this grant. We'd be able to overcome the obstacles just like our forefathers did with the um, American independence as well as overcoming the Allegheny Mountains obstacle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lowe. Members, questions? This is a significant project and there's many components to it. Um, if we are not certain what our ultimate allocation of dollars will be, but is this a project that could be scaled um, to get you to the point where you could be part of the 2026 celebration and um, make a significant impact on the structure itself? Yes, uh, it certainly could be. We're used to operating on a version of scale based upon what money we can raise, what grants we can secure, and this would just be another example of that, so absolutely. Very good, thank you. Any further questions from colleagues? Thank you very much for your testimony. Okay, thank here you for your time. With that, um, I would like to thank all of the testifiers, all of our members here today, all of the volunteers, of course, Penn State, Harrisburg, once again. Um, for all they did to make this hearing possible. Thank you for your participation. I uh, want everyone to note that we have five more hearings. Is it five more hearings? Uh, yeah. Five more hearings. And our next public hearing is scheduled for Thursday, August 3rd. We will be up in Tioga County, about as far north as we can get. Um, but I want to extend my profound gratitude to each and every one of you who have provided testimony here today. I can't find a project that is not most worthy of consideration. And I will tell you that I know we're not going to be able to fund everything, but certainly um, the fact that you have gotten these projects to the point that they are, um, we will certainly be sharing these and, and looking at other ways to make this happen if America 250 PA's infrastructure uh, committee can't ultimately fund you all. Um, just again, thank you. Uh, it has been truly, truly worthwhile and we really appreciate your testimony today. I'm going to turn it over to Representative Solomon for any closing remarks and thoughts. Thank you so much. You all did a great job. It's great to be here and we're going to have a really difficult time uh, after all these hearings are done trying to figure out the ones that we want to try and fund. And But to the Senator's point, we want to make sure that Pennsylvania is the epicenter in 2026. So to the extent that we can work with you, even if our committee cannot fund these projects, 
to get other agencies to provide funding to look elsewhere. We want to do that. Yeah, so so it's, it's not just about the committee. It's, it's, it's everyone trying to row in the same direction as we approach 2026. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Representative Solomon. Senator Street. Much has been said. Thank you for um, your, your work. Projects were impressive. Uh, it, it's like we got a history lesson from each and every one of you, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to give, impart that kind of a lesson to uh, all the people of Pennsylvania. Thank you, and Representative Kim. We're grateful that you could join us today. And with that, uh, I will now recess the committee until the call of the chairs. Thank you again.